This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Uh, today we're talking about, um, well, we're getting a demonstration of a brain-computer interface using uh, uh, a, uh, a Motive Epoch headset, um, a bit of history. In 1974, SRI did a, did a study uh, and uh, built a headset, not unlike uh, this one, though substantially more primitive, and built a system with the Link 8, which after some effort and training, you could type on A T T Y by thinking the words. Now, exactly how that works was left as an open uh, question. I put one of the early uh, reports on that on the website for those of you who want to explore history. Uh, now we're going to look at what's happening today in the gaming world. Our speaker is Randy Breen from Emotive Systems, and he's done more games than anybody in the universe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> no. In any case, a lot of them know. all successful, and this is an, an extremely interesting new input device. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Randy Breen, and I have uh, Marco De La Torre, also from Emotive Systems. Uh, Marco's a researcher originally from Sydney, where our research lab is located. Uh, he's now relocated to San Francisco with us, and uh, we have a business office there. It's where most of the commercial activity for the company is, is located. Uh, so what we want to do today is show you uh, both what uh, we're planning to do uh, in the con consumer form as well as what we're doing right now with uh, beta equipment. Uh, the beta equipment is basically uh, it, it, uh, is a headset that is a wireless EEG system uh, that transmits that, uh, does some signal processing, transmits that uh, to the, the PC to a dongle that he's got plugged in here. And then there's software running on the laptop that takes those signals and converts them into decisions about his states. And those states are very discreet. It's, um, it's not as if we're, we're uh, making claims about being able to imagine uh, text and seeing that appear on the screen. I think that uh, although that may eventually be possible, that's not the angle that we're uh, approaching the market. The intent is uh, to think about the device as, uh, as a supplementary form of interface to the, to the computer. Right now, the computer only has information that, that you give it. That is that uh, when you communicate to the device, it's all direct controls. Those are conscious controls. They're all uh, done with intent. The, the problem is that uh, that's only really half of the communication link. In, in real life, you know, when we speak to someone, when we're, when we're exchanging information, there's a lot more going on, and it's bi-directional in its nature. That is that we're perceiving other aspects of information and how that's being trans translated. And, and that's important because if all we had was the literal information, uh, it would be very difficult to understand complex ideas. And uh, I think that, uh, well, I want to make a case that there is a, there's a gap that exists that's critical for us to really be able to utilize these machines adequately. Uh, but what we're going to do is start really uh, from the beginning and, and, and try and uh, demonstrate what is practical in the short term. So what uh, you see on screen now is uh, a headset. It's a design of the consumer form. This exists in a limited quantity right now. Uh, but the beta we can reproduce easily, and so we're going to demonstrate with the beta, but this is the headset that we intend to ship later in the year. The nature of the equipment is almost identical. The form factor is changing here a little bit, but uh, if you notice, 
they're, they're, uh, the electronics, the battery, the sensors, the wireless communication, the software that's running on the PC, um, all of it is very similar to the one that we're going to use today. And the, the headset uh, goes on from the back rather than over the top, but really that's just uh, a, a decision in part uh, aesthetic and in part uh, for practicality and robustness. Uh, but really the design is, is the same in the sense that it's form-fitting, the electrodes all lo locate themselves automatically, it goes on a really wide variety of head sizes, and it sets up rapidly. And all of those things were uh, substantial uh, challenges to design. Um, I came on to the company uh, two years after they were in development. Uh, the, all of the work was done in Sydney at that stage, and it was really just starting to, to realize what might be possible, but in a raw form. That is, on, in the laboratory, we could start to detect some emotions, some excitement, for instance, uh, but we hadn't gotten to a point where we could, uh, we didn't have a physical system in place, and we hadn't gotten to a point where we really understood how we could apply those things. And, and so my focus has really been on um, helping the company understand how to, how to productize uh, the work and, and apply it in a way that's practical. So uh, as you can see on the, on the slide, it talks about some of those practical applications. I think that some of those may seem very obvious um, and some um, may be more remote. But right now, uh, games, for instance, uh, there's, there's an obvious trend towards semantic and natural interface. And we see this as an extension of that, and I'll give some examples of why. Uh, but we also uh, see this as the potential of being able to extend your presence in a virtual space in a way that it applies to games, but maybe even more importantly to social networking environments that rely on tools that don't currently exist. You know, if, if you have to puppeteer a character and you're constantly conscious of every aspect of its animation and movement, um, then you're not going to be able to concentrate on really the experience. And, and another way to think about that problem is from the reverse, which is if you walked around and, and, and you were always conscious of how you're being perceived to a point where you had to worry about you know, every little detail of your, your face, the way you move, uh, how you communicate uh, language through movement, then you'd be preoccupied with that in a way that would cripple you. And, you know, some people, you know, they get in front of a crowd and they have trouble speaking for that reason because they're preoccupied with their own thoughts instead of what they're supposed to be talking about. And so this is the, the, the bridge that we want to fulfill, that uh, basically we want to bridge that gap and allow, you know, provide a tool that allows that uh, natural control over uh, character movement and allows someone to participate in the environment naturally. So just some really brief statistics. I think that, uh, again, some of this may seem obvious, but the, the number of people that are spending time online obviously is very large. What may not be as obvious is the number of people that are spending time in virtual environments where they're using a projection of themselves in one form or another. Uh, World of Warcraft is one example, which is hardcore gamers that are um, spending you know, 20 hours a week on average playing a game. Um, that's a subset, but that subset is still 10 million large, and that's just one product. Uh, what we know is that there's a need for social networking online. Uh, Facebook is, is an obvious example of it. What's less uh, obvious is its value once you're there. It doesn't really feel very social. Um, you know, it can be used as a, a bulletin board, but it's not um, an immediate exchange of ideas. And so there's, there's a a gravitation towards these, these kinds of environments, and I think that you're going to see some um, more dramatic ones uh, you know, really starting to, to uh, become popular in the short term. So we also see uh, the potential of using the device in a way that uh, extends the capabilities of a product. We don't really assume that you get rid of the joystick or the keyboard. What we assume is that we can enable things that those tools don't really work very well for. So uh, another example is Harry Potter, uh, the fantasy of magic, 
telekinesis. These are really old, ancient ideas and things that are um, universal fantasies across cultures. What we found is that, that we're able to use some of these technologies in an entertainment environment that is uh, really, it, it allows you to participate in a more direct way than a manual mechanical interface can achieve. And we will demonstrate that a little, a little later. So uh, the idea, uh, again, for our, our consumer product is to come to market with a product of its own that's designed for the headset. You can think about it like uh, Guitar Hero. There's a piece of software and a hardware device. And those two things work in concert with one another. Uh, but we're also trying to provide more value to somebody that's buying the headset initially. And we're also trying to give cues to the development community so that they start to understand how these things can be used. And, and I think that that's particularly important in our case because the headset's so different. You know, there isn't really um, a very good analog uh, to what it does and how you might use it. But the Harry Potter example I gave a moment ago, uh, we're able to use keyboard emulation to take the detections that we can do with the headset and then pass those to instructions the application already uses. And then uh, basically enable the game in a way that's unique. And that may sound trivial, but one example is we had children that were playing with uh, the system. And nine, 10 year old, 12 year old kids playing Harry Potter. And one of them commented that when I play Harry Potter as it's meant to be played, that they, they feel like they're controlling Harry Potter. And that's fulfilling at some level. Uh, but when they use the headset and they imagine lifting and they're able to lift an object by thinking about lifting and then they see it happen, uh, they, they literally said, I felt like I am Harry Potter. And so that, that piece of information is important and it's at the heart of any semantic or natural interface. That is that you're not translating your control through uh, an, a set of arbitrary commands that someone else has made up. And I think that uh, what we find is that that broader market, that acceptance of um, the, the world outside of the core game market is really enabled when people are able to do things in a way they expect and not have to think about the input. Um, so the last thing I want to mention on this slide is that um, we also see uh, a portal where the device is basically also enabling ideas that really aren't practical for other companies. So for instance, uh, we believe that, that it's going to be possible uh, to detect a person's affect and use that information to sort information in a virtual environment. And so we want to provide some tools to be able to do that. We also want to uh, provide a, a place for people that have created uh, emo key combinations for particular applications to upload those. We want to be able to have uh, people that buy the headset this year uh, to be able to go up there next year and get new detections. Um, so all of those things are going to be possible through um, an online uh, presence that is really a community for the headset. So again, just uh, to summarize, we have uh, a wireless device. Uh, it it uh, collects EEGs, very subtle signals on the scalp. Um, those are processed, transmitted wirelessly to, this, to a receiver on the PC that's really just a, a dongle. And then those are, are uh, defined as events that can be attached to applications. Uh, and the, the other thing I haven't mentioned yet is uh, there's a gyro attached to this as well. So um, basically head movement can be used to control an avatar's head movements. And it turns out that, that head movement in character animation is quite important, that quite a lot of information gets uh, conveyed when you're nodding or you're, you're communicating uh, in speech. And it may sound simple, uh, but in reality, it, it, it reinforces ideas that are important as we exchange information. Um, but we also think that that has enough sensitivity that it can be used for you know, mouse control in an uh, accessibility application where someone doesn't have the use of their hands. 
or uh, camera control in a case that replaces the joystick, there's, a, there's an opportunity to be able to use your head to communicate intent for direction. So now I want to talk about the market we're entering and, and what we're doing uh, and why. So the, the nature of the company is, is that we have a vision for a broad application of the device. But it's also important that we're able to enter the market in a way that we can be successful. And that, that entry needs to be um, fulfilling to the people that, that it's important to. And so um, of all the areas that we could imagine the, the headset being used in, um, games really seem like the obvious uh, place. And, and it's, there's a variety of reasons for that. One, one in particular, if you think about uh, the way uh, technology has migrated into the home, virtually all of the innovations in, in home computing have actually come out of uh, what's popular in gaming because that's where the money is, that's where uh, people are excited. You know, I, when I started in the game industry, the, the routine was that you were buying a new game. Half the time it was to demonstrate justification for the expensive computer that you bought and, and really show all your friends how cool something uh, looks or how, you know, what, what might be possible in the future. And, to some extent, that, that, that's still true. Um, but, but obviously, graphics have been driving the industry for many years. And we're getting to a point where there's diminished return. That is that as realism goes up, the cost of developing the whole structure goes up with it. And it's not as uh, simple as simply, it's not as limited as you know, these characters are expensive to make. It's the whole world has to come up to the visual resolution of the scene the characters are in. That is, if the character is highly detailed, then things around the character have to be detailed or the character stands out funny. And, and not, just, not just look right, they have to behave right. That is, they have to animate and they have to behave in ways that are consistent with, with uh, your expectations of realism. <coughs> and, and so we're getting to a point where that's becoming such a burden that the quality of those experiences diminish. The other aspect of it is that the interface to those, those features is so limited that in most cases they aren't as rewarding as they should be. Um, what's interesting is graphics have progressed dramatically. AI has not. Physics has only recently really progressed in a significant way. And these things are critical to make the whole scene come together. Well, with respect to character AI, a lot of the problems are, are associated with no information about the user. If, the, if the, the player is experiencing something and you're trying to communicate with a character, right now you can give them something or you can hit them or you can do something in the scene, but any of those things have to be gross events. They can't be subtle and they aren't about character interaction. And as a result, storytelling really suffers and the, and the behavior of those characters is very limited. And so this is an area that we see as important to the industry and also important to us. So this slide really tries to dramatize this, this change that's gone on over time. So over the, the last 30, 35 years, we've gone from two colors, well, black and white if you want to call them color. Uh, and uh, you know, obviously the, the controllers that you see, um, they've hardly changed. The, the nature of them are very similar. They've added buttons. Um, they've added joysticks over time. But really, th functionally, they're very similar to their predecessors and have hardly moved. And then re you know, more recently, we've seen some trends um, to semantic interface devices that aren't necessarily duplicating real interface, but they represent it in a way that is more direct and compelling than using uh, uh, an abstract interface device. And, uh, you know, I could, I could use some other, I can give some other examples as well here, but uh, Nintendogs, which is quite different from these other products, is another example where you have a, you have a game that you can train uh, a virtual dog by speaking to it, and it does voice recognition. Well, um, it, as it turns out, that is a much more fulfilling exchange than trying to control your pet uh, through buttons. And then, finally, the Wii which is the most dramatic example of this trend 
uh, particularly because it's across a platform and, and also because of the nature of the company that's behind it. So again, brain-computer interface, we see that this is where uh, we play as uh, a natural interface, as a supplement to these other controls. And uh, we think that, that it's a missing piece that the industry uh, needs. And again, uh, the idea is that the device plays a secondary, uh, a, another layer of communication. It's not just the only uh, control method for, um, for computer interaction. So now I want to talk really about the nature of what we're doing. Um, the, again, the system is EEG, it's low latency, it's portable, it's inexpensive, um, and uh, passive and non-invasive. The, the nature of the detections, we have three suites of detections we've released uh, at this point. Uh, they're grouped in, in uh, sets, facial expressions, uh, affect, uh, uh, effective is for effective uh, uh, detection, that is emotion, uh, and cognitive, which is this idea of being able to control events uh, with intent. And each of these has different uh, uh, applications. Uh, I think that in some cases uh, a product might use all of them, but in other cases it may use portions of them. And the nature of, uh, we have an SDK that we've released. The SDK allows developers to attach these in discreetly so that it doesn't have to use everything. It uses what the application really needs. Um, but, uh, uh, Excuse me. Uh, the uh, so sorry. The next thing that we're going to do here is go ahead and show the software development so kit in action. Can I, can I interrupt you for a second? Mm -hmm. um, basically, what you have is a bunch of sensors that sit on the on the, the surface of the skin. Yes. Uh, these detect uh, uh, small variations in electrical. Right. That's right. on the surface of the scalp. Um, then you take those signals, and there are some number of them, it looks like 12 or 14 or something, and you run this into a, an on-headset on processor? No. So the, there is some processing done uh, in the unit itself, but the processing there is, is mainly uh, conditioning and signal processing to send it to the PC. The detections are then uh, actually uh, determined at the PC. So the, the, um, uh, the processing is all done there. And it can be done as an independent process or it can be done in a, in a way that's linked to an application. So you get a string of numbers. And you put this into some sort of neural net or something like that. And coming out, you get a set of other numbers which correspond to the uh, various uh, the events that we defined. That you're, you're That's right. So the defense, the the events that that we um, actually provide the application are discrete, <coughs> and we'll show a control panel. And so I think this will be more. It, it's easier to demonstrate than it is to talk about in the abstract. So are you ready? So, uh, let's see. <coughs> You're not up. <laughs> there we are. Okay, so now what you're looking at is a software tool that we use to establish connection with the device and actually evaluate the detections themselves. If you were using this in, in an application environment, all of these controls would be built into the application itself. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have a little widget that can be run independently. So if you're running it in a Windows environment, you can then attach uh, these, these emo key, that is pass keyboard emulation to an, an application by running this separately in the control panel. And then uh, it's basically running in a layer be between the application and the device. 
But the first thing you're looking at is a setup screen, which um, doesn't really do much than, other than show that the signals are all, all there. It's actually duplicated up in the upper right-hand corner. And there's some uh, instructions here about uh, the, the signal quality. But really, what's relevant is the next three tabs. And, that, and each of those represents uh, these detection suites. And we'll start with uh, uh, effective. Uh, excuse me, expressive. Now you're looking at a, a very simplistic avatar. And beside it, you, you see um, mark the events that Marco has, uh, the events that it's defining Marco's behavior. So if you, Marco, can you sit up a little bit? Okay, it's a little, there's a little bit of shadow on your eyes, but um, I see. Sorry. Yeah, it's you. Is it me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you see the events uh, as decisions being made on the graph. The upper uh, graph is indicating blink, and then as we go down the list, uh, there's wink right and left, and he can look right and left as well. Do you want me to just run down? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, can you raise your brow and, and furrow? <laughs> and kind of obviously sm he's given smile away <laughs> plenty early. And, and clench, you yeah. know, once he gets going he doesn't stop. And then there's smirk right and left. And so uh, this is, um, the avatar again is very simplistic, but you can see that by him just be behaving naturally, the character can uh, come to life in ways that aren't really practical otherwise. Now, uh, you want to give Robo, uh, the robot yeah. demonstration? Do you want to turn the gyro on too? Yeah. set up the communication. Okay. So he's just going to load a different avatar just to show uh, another one by contrast. I'm going to have to restart my control panel. Wow, it's really hard to use this little screen. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. It's impossible. <laughs> Close. Yes. But um, you, you notice that there was state information in, in the graphs themselves as well. So some of those events are binary. Blinking, for instance, is on or off, um, although it's on or off for a period. Um, smiling, by contrast, clinching or um, you know, smirk, uh, these are all uh, varied uh, events between 0 and 1. Is there training involved? So the, the different detections, the answer is different. Um, for facial expressions, there's no training. There's a universal signature that uh, these things work with immediately. You can tweak the sensitivity of each of the features to get, uh, get it to behave in a way that you're, you're more satisfied with. You can also record events on uh, demand to basically get it, again, to refine it to your liking more effectively. But uh, really, it works uh, in a universal way across users. Same thing with the motion, and in that, in that particular case, effective, um, it's, it's critical that that particular feature work uh, across users without any uh, interference by the user because most people can't really put themselves in the state that they need to be in in order to validate it. Uh, but the syst there is a learning system uh, built into it that allows it to improve over time as well. Oh, cheers. Yeah, that'll help a lot. Thanks. Um, the last, the last set of features, though, cognitive, um, those are trained, uh, but we'll actually show you a training demonstration to give you a sense of how that works. All right, just playing the A B game. Mm -hmm. How are, how are you?
you get going? <laughs> okay. Uh, if it doesn't work, let's just move on after this one. I can show it on my laptop. <sighs> we got to make sure that good contact looks like it has this below blinking in the top forehead. Yeah. You have your electrodes over the, over the hair or something, so you have to place them properly. Um, the, the nature of the system is that they're located um, automatically, really, and you may shuffle it to get it to settle properly. Um, the the nature of the sensors are that they're really just sitting on top of the scalp. So, yeah. The, you know the 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 device has a certain amount of spring loading in it, and that keeps the tension uniform. All right. Were you unable to get it? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Resolution. Okay. So we'll skip uh, that demo. But uh, the next thing you're looking at is three graphs, four graphs. Uh, the first set on the left really represents the same detection, but two versions of it. <coughs> and its excitement, you can see Marco's excitement level as he's trying to get something working that's not. Um, but the, the, the upper one is a long-term graph. The lower one is a more immediate uh, indicator of his level of arousal. So the, uh, you can also think about it as really two dimensions. Um, you know, excitement is the high end of the graph. Calm is the low end of the graph. And, and both are relevant because he'll tend to fluctuate down towards the middle. And it'll graduate. He actually has to concentrate and really relax consciously in order to get it to stay low. Uh, uh, the, the next set in the middle is engagement and boredom. And again, you know, these are detections that we've refined specifically for game use. Uh, there are other things that are in research right now. But the idea is to be able to extract information about a player's perception of things and then to be able to use that to help modify the experience in a way that's, that's going to improve that. Now, it could be character interaction. That is, the character might behave in a more human way. But it, it could also be difficulty adjustment. And that one in particular is important to the game audience because uh, there's such a wide range of people that are playing these games, and you want a uniform experience, but their abilities aren't uniform. And so being able to tailor that so that someone is, is uh, not, not th someone is challenged but not frustrated too long. Um, the last one uh, for that purpose is frustration. And the, the point here again is that frustration turns out to be an important metric, not necessarily in the negative. That is that, like most things in life, if it's too easy, it's not going to be very interesting. And so, you know, it's important that there's a wall and a barrier, and, there, and, and that's perceived for a certain period of time, but that it doesn't remain high for a prolonged period. And then, really, if, um, if it doesn't exist, if it's not high enough or it's too high for too long, uh, both experiences are going to be poor. Uh, again, some more base application of these uh, ideas. Um, we, have a, we have a game demo that we'll show at the end. But uh, some of the applications involve, for instance, changing music to um, evoke a feeling and reinforce it, um, to trigger it when you're excited, basically reaffirming excitement. Um, also, changing background colors or changing the impression of the scene um, we have uh, an example where you can tell whether a person is really um, not interested, starting to uh, become disinterested, or whether they're concentrating on something. And it, and it, and it becomes a way to, to be conscious of it in yourself, which is, uh, is, is actually interesting from a self-reinforcement standpoint. So um, the last demonstration um, here is cognitive. Yes, please. And we're going to start with a fresh profile. So basically, there's no information about Marco's brain state. And so now he's going to start by recording a background brain state. And this is done in a tool window. This isn't necessarily how you'd use it in the real world. The game example we have, for instance, these, this training session is just built into the fantasy. Um, you, you go up to a sensei, the sensei tells you to relax your mind. You practice relaxation for a moment. 
Um, after that, he tells you to lift the stone and he shows you how you can do it. And then you m imagine doing that same action. And so the idea here, again, is this is the control panel, but um, uh, it doesn't have to be that base. So Marco, can you? I'm not going to have a mic. Uh, so can you walk me through it? Yeah. Well yeah. Done. Um, so I can't read it either. Uh, push is the first thing he's got selected. And it's, it's from a list of 12 uh, actions plus uh, a 13th one I'll, I'll go through in a moment. But uh, basically, the idea is that he selects an action that he wants to perform. And then he's going to train the computer uh, in that action by uh, performing it during this, the, the specified period. So now he's going to go ahead and start imagine pushing. You can see his hand moving there. But as I'll show you in a moment, it doesn't have anything to do with his hand movement. So now he should be able to push the object there. And so, um, <laughs> so Marco, um, now can you push without your hand, please? So the, the, again, the point is not, he's not pushing with his hand. He uses that as a cue. It, it can be used as your own point of focus. Um, and it also helps us understand what he's doing sometimes. So uh, the next thing I want to tr demonstrate is disappear. And this is interesting because it's not a movement. It's a visualization exercise. And again, there's, this is just a six-second training period. And he's going to try imagining disappear. And he made it disappear. And what's also relevant, um, well, can you, can you go to two actions and show the contrast of those two? I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he was training with a single example? He was, he was showing oh, one example at a time, right? Now he's going to show. So each example is only one training. Um, yeah, so he's practiced. And yeah. so Obviously. he's better than most people. <laughs> but generally, anybody that comes in is going to see some movement right away. Um, I, I have seen a couple people struggle to get movement the first training session. Um, but generally, everybody that tries it sees some movement right away. And it has more to do with your ability to focus than it has to do with the system's ability to detect it. So if you're scattered about how you think about push, like you're not sure, um, that will actually affect the detection. And so it becomes a skill to be able to think clearly for a period of time. Um, and uh, I think that you're doing both. If you, if you have ADD, that's not good. Well, um, <laughs> I think that's debatable. I'm just trying to make it. Yeah. Well, well that's a question. Uh, I, I think there's an argument to be made that it could be used as a tool to help. Uh, ADD. Yeah, ADD. A few years ago, I think uh, a little more than two years ago, there was research at maybe Ohio State University where a paraplegic was able to change channels on the TV by thinking about it. Yeah. Is this based on that research? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, all of the research, that you, all of the detections you're seeing are proprietary research based, uh, that was originally based out of Sydney. Um, and there, there are patent applications for most of these things. How much of cognitive is yes, true EEG signal versus EMG, like rolling your eyes or clenching your uh, Well, um, I, I can't get into the nature of the detection. Uh, the, all of the signals are collected at the scalp. EMG is typically localized detection. Uh, and so um, there are variations in how we detect for these events. But so there, it's not uniform. It's not purely an EEG only, whereas a or uh, I think you should. Can you describe your background, please? <laughs> I'm Australian. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm assuming that you can hear this at the back. Yeah, if you, if you yeah. I wasn't presuming to have it on for long. Um, so, I joined Emotive just over three years ago. 
um, doing research in Sydney, basically. Um, not at the top. Uh, just working on the cognitive suite, actually, and doing some work on the expressive stuff as well. And uh, as anyone who works on EEG can tell you, it's practically impossible to remo remove EMG. Um, the nature of our signals are so tiny that the slightest interference, even from, um, you, know, you know, in medical systems, if you're standing on a power board, if you're standing near an outlet, that's enough to shut you down. Obviously, for emotive, a lot of our work is in uh, making this system robust to a lounge room use. So that's a lot of our work. When we do testing, we do it really in two ways. One, we do it with a controller in hand playing Halo 3, you know, but um, firing weapons with our mind. Or we do it um, walking around in Second Life and you know, using the expressive suite for interaction. So it's really just, just as you'd use in your lounge room. The second way we do it is really to address the issue that you've, uh, you've brought up, which is to really get to the root of what a, a BCI is, which is really the ability to have an internal process um, that a, an external device can uh, identify. And so it's, it's tough for me here to present it that way because obviously uh, you know, I'm not a quadriplegic or a tetraplegic and I can't hold bolt still when I do things. But um, one thing we can do is, of course, let you try it and uh, assure you that in-house what we do is um, have that strongly in mind. Uh, obviously the, the attraction of the cognitive suite is really this fantasy of telekinesis or uh, mind control in some way. And so doing it using even the gyro uh, defeats that whole purpose. I hope that addresses your question a little. Yeah. Mm. So uh, can we show the game demo? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the next thing we'll show is uh, a short uh, game that we've created that tries to connect all these pieces and put it in application uh, uniformly. How far off are you? I am about 30 seconds off. Okay. Depending on whether the screen is supported, <laughs> it should be fine. Running at about 300 square. How much timeline is there between the detection of them? Or so the, the answer there is, is somewhat different depending on the detections as well. Um, facial detection, the latency is very short, uh, and it's varied depending on which one. But uh, if you watch him blink, the, the uh, lag is very, very subtle. Um, the cognitive is a bit longer, but what's interesting about cognitive is that uh, there, there's a known uh, delay between the time that you intend to do something and the time that you actually are aware you do it. And so the question of when you're starting the, the process is not exactly clear. Um, we are looking at about a one second window to make sure that we see what we think we're seeing. Um, so it, a lot of times, it, it, depending on who you see try it, you may see an immediate response almost, you know, it's miraculously fast. In another case, you may see a long delay, even with Marco. But I think that all of us have, have used the system and we're all aware that our own uh, mental state is a key aspect of the control. That is that if you're not focused, then it's going to re be reflected in the interface. And, and it's, uh, it's very easy to be, it's very easy to realize that you're not as focused in your thinking as you might have uh, believed you would be. So what Marco has here is um, uh, the game. He's walk Can you uh, turn towards the sensei just a little bit? Do you want me to? Oh, is it that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so he's, yeah, the frame rate's very poor. Um, so that's going to that's gonna make this difficult. But basically, he walks up to these events. The sensei gives him instructions about what he's supposed to do. And he's able to um, basically replicate the instructions of the sensei and, and, and progress through the environment. So in this case, there are these spirits that uh, are mischievous in nature, and he needs to scare them away in order to uh, progress. And the sensei is describing that. So he says, make a face, um, you know, uh, scare them uh, with a look. Keep an eye on the sky. Yeah. OK. <laughs> So by growling and, 
and uh, forgiving the frame rate. The menace, the yeah, point. the frame rate's hurting us. I think this is going to be tough. <laughs> okay. They are moving away, but the frame rate's so slow. It's yeah, the, the, the. Just to be clear, the frame rate is due to the projector. Well, uh, it's due to some aspect of the connection because we've run this on plenty of other con projectors and never had a frame rate issue. What kind of test and how much processing power do you need to, considering that you have so many sensors, yeah. including the accelerometer, so the EGs? We're, we're, we started out with support for dual core machines uh, initially, but that, that includes du dual core laptops. So uh, really, we're operating um, you know, any, any of the current systems. It's not really impacting performance in any significant way. Uh, the, the, the reason I'm asking this question is, uh, do you see having this an impact on mainstream gaming uh, platforms, uh, considering that the power, processing power is going to be considerably lower than uh, the wall or why? Well, actually, uh, the, the Consoles that are coming out now, in some ways, are more powerful than many of the home uh, machines, and they have the benefit of not having the overhead of the operating system. Um, the, you know, an Xbox 360 is, is multi-core. Um, obviously, the Sony PlayStation 3 uh, multi-core, uh, multi-processor. So the, the point is that uh, we think that we actually will run in those environments even more effectively than uh, the lower end dual core machines. Um, we r we've run a, a couple frame rate tests to try and, because it, it can be tough to measure performance, particularly in a multi threaded environment. But, um, you know, we're seeing maybe a 8% uh, CPU consumption in a graphically and physically intense environment. Um, you know, and given that most of these games are running above refresh. It, it doesn't seem to be a problem. And, and that was, we, we have the ability to run two headsets simultaneously on the same machine. Um, and so that test was actually run with two sets of detections running simultaneously. Well, um, trial and error. The, uh, the first system we started with an array of 32. Uh, we isolated the most commonly used. Um, we, we also started with a flexible system, so we didn't know what kind of uh, form the device was going to need to take in order to fit any head. Uh, we actually gravitated to a rigid structure because we found that the flexible one was breaking all the time, um, and um, also it was difficult to get location consistent. Uh, there's, there's some limitations to the fact that um, this device is, um, you know, rigid. That is, that the, the reach around the front in particular, or around to the very back, um, varies somewhat depending on head sizes, but that hasn't really affected the nature of the detection in a way that, that uh, has kept us from getting the results that we need. So uh, we found that the rigid structure has actually benefited the system dramatically, that is, that we're able to take the same device and move it from one person to the other uh, rapidly and without without seeing the kind of problems that we were seeing earlier. What? Uh, actually, it had more to do with uh, where we saw um, the activities relevant to each detection, and and so we we started with a bigger set and we. Uh, we basically broke that down over time to a, a subset, and you know, frankly, if you if we divide if we produce a device that was focused on a subset of the features that we've shown, then we could break it down further. But the intent really is to de develop a device that has a broad range of features, so it has broad application initially, and then we can tailor it to other needs later. If I might just add to that quickly from a research perspective, obviously. I think it's on. Yeah. I'm well trained. Um, <laughs> from a research perspective, obviously, this is not a limitation uh, in-house. There's nothing stopping us from using uh, a much larger array of sensors, and in fact, often that's what we do. Um, we have to reconcile uh, what we'd like from a research perspective from what's practical at the consumer 
level. So uh, in-house, the answer is um, we use a lot more than this a lot of the time because we're interested in finding the signals that we're looking for. And then we need to reconcile that with what a consumer is willing to wear and pay for and uh, what they want to enjoy as well. So um, I'd like to find out if there's a volunteer <laughs> to actually try. The stereotype California environment. Somebody brings, a, somebody brings a dog to work. Have you put it on a dog? <laughs> no. 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 A girlfriend? Yeah, uh, you know. I don't, I don't. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah. I haven't put it on a dog. I have put it on a girlfriend. <laughs> I have put it on my nine-year-old. It's a good time yeah. to uh, ask the awkward questions when the effective suite is on display. That's right. Yeah. So I don't know how the dog would respond, but uh, can I switch back to you? And I can awesome. set up here. Sorry. What fraction of the gaming budget comes from kids with smaller heads? That can be a problem? Well, as it turns out, uh, the average game player is 33 years old. <laughs> you think that's fun? I mean, it's, it seems hard to believe, but the fact is that you have all these people that grew up playing games, and some of them stopped playing games as they got older, and a lot of them stopped watching TV. <laughs> and, and so uh, as, as the, the, the medium matures, the, age, the average age is going up, and so it just so happens that you know, the, the majority of people that are buying games and things like this are actually in their late 20s or early 30s. So it's the, but, but that being, you know, that being said, you know, we have tried it on many children um, you know, that are friends and family and, and um, haven't had any issue with the head sizes for that. So what, do you, what is the effective uh, price of this unit going to be when it gets in? $300 is the price, yeah. Good thing you're going after a 33 year old market, not an 8 year old market. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there any reason you don't make them different sizes? Like um, well, I think that from a practical standpoint, if we make it different sizes, it's going to limit the audience. Makes it difficult to, um, you know, you have to know what size is going to fit you. Um, and it creates some retail problems, like having more than one size and running out of the one that's popular and not having enough of the one that isn't. So some accuracy like how like on the first screen where it's just getting number of smiles number of blinks things like that like how many of your blinks is it actually getting well yeah yes <laughs> uh, more than a little um, actually a lot of our time is devoted to um, assessing how the algorithms are going and, and not just on the people who use it a lot like myself uh, but also on first-time users, and uh, as the experience progresses, what's your, you know, learning curve to get into the the tech room? The expressive suite is an interesting interesting example because in human-human interaction, we all identify when somebody is smiling, and so uh, the process is quite literal. Uh, for the effective suite, uh, you might think about how there are challenges there around how you test the accuracy of that system. So, in a gross sense, well, I can tell you that I feel a little excited. I mean. If I'm having trouble with the system, I'm definitely feeling excited, but am I excited full scale or am I excited half my scale? If, uh, you know, if I were to trip over in front of you all, would that make me more excited? And uh, that's very personal, and so it's a tough thing to measure in terms of accuracy. The cognitive suite is somewhere in between. Uh, we can certainly ask people to perform an action and see how that responds. Are the emotions then not functions of the like smile and blink rate? Because I can imagine you could derive equations like when you're smiling by X percent, you're happy. A developer has uh, access to both separately. So the answer is the uh, affect detections are not uh, based on that information per se. Um, the, and at the same time, we actually expose information about blink rate duration you know, are they clinching? Is there tension? Are they smiling? Um, and, and some of those events in concert with one another are relevant too. And the, and the software you showed us is what you would get as the, as the consumer, or is that only for developing? So uh, the consumer gets 
the ability to utilize those detections in the control panel um, and tailor them to an application with the keyboard interface. So if you have a product that you want to use the headset with, you can give a complex instruction like, uh, you know, uh, cognitive power for this feature is over 50%, you know, for a period. Um, but the, uh, the developer gets exposed, exposed to the raw data, that is the, de the determination of each detection can be attached to the application directly. And uh, that can be actually downloaded right now. Um, there's an SDK Lite, which is an emulator for the detection. So you can run, uh, basically you can pass information that looks like uh, behavior um, through the API and use that in the application now. And then when the headset shows up, you can actually um, see it working in that way. That answer your question. Why don't you get your volunteer? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe further to that point. Yeah, come on up. Um, maybe further to that point, a good example is frustration detection, where I could be playing a game and be frustrated and smiling, which is probably an indication that I'm having a good time, versus frustrating, uh, being frustrated and grimacing, which probably indicates I'm not having much fun at all. So that's an example of how the suites can be used in parallel. You don't have any secret features you haven't shown, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Not that we're showing to that. <laughs> aren't you supposed to say, I've never seen you before, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you move in a little bit just like yeah. that? Well, well, there's, some, well, there's some new things to the functionality that, that actually arose um, while you were testing in the lab that you did not anticipate or different uses okay. for the product? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, <laughs> it's a compliment. Uh, I mean, it's hard to say because really, in some ways, when the research started, we, we were motivated by the idea uh, without knowing exactly what we were going to be able to achieve. Um, you know, when I, when I came on board, uh, excitement was demonstrable. Um, facial expressions were perceived as viable. Um, cognitive didn't... Uh, you know, there was, there was an idea for an experiment, but it wasn't established yet. And so um, really what, what we then did was try and isolate these areas where we saw value and, um, and refine those in ways that we could uh, you know, express them uh, so that they can be used across applications reliably. Um, so there's other things going on in research that are, you know, still in progress in that effect. So. You mentioned our research many times. What fraction of your, oh, I should ask, existing research, how useful was it for you? Did you think it started all from scratch, all proprietary, narrow, focused, or did you uh, take any, anything in that was existing or whatever? I'm trying to get a um, sense of the yeah, balance. Yeah, uh, I think that research is a funny thing because it's, uh, it, it, more often than not, you really don't you don't end up where you thought you were going to be. Sure. And so you, you have to kind of see where your gains are sure. and then establish how you can exploit those. And, and, and that's, 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 that sounds like an explanation on the back end, right? It doesn't, that's the, while you're in it, I don't think that it comes across that way. But the, I, I think that there's a discovery process that's separate from the research itself, which is you need to be inspired by the things that look like there's something going on there that's valuable. And then imagination needs to fill the gap in attaching that in ways that is, are unexpected sometimes. And you know, I think that, that that aspect of imagination is just as important as the research itself, because if you can't make the two connect, then you don't necessarily have the result that you need. Like for example, one signal further down, bottom third, is probably associated with ellipse. It's rather noisy, so from a research point of view, there's something wrong with that. Yeah, well, the, the demonstration we did today included some detections that have just been released. Some have been out longer than others, and so some are more robust as a, as a, uh, that's right. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, I think that some of it has to do with us needing to balance the relationship of those detections more effectively. So, 
we wanted to show as much as we could today. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any, anybody? Yeah, we Brad, you used uh, test populations uh, both in Australia and the United States. Did you find any significant difference in the cross cultures? Um, no, I think the Australians are, are uh, quite similar to the U.S. And <laughs> <laughs> Did you expect, you expect uh, to uh, try, try it in uh, European and Asian groups as well? Um, well, I mean, as it turns out, uh, two of the founders are Asian, uh, both Vietnamese. And there's a community of people that are in, uh, I mean, half of the research team in Sydney is, is Asian. And so uh, I, I actually don't anticipate that there's going to be a significant difference there based on what we've seen so far. Um, both Sydney and San Francisco are actually also um, pretty good places for being uh, multicultural, uh, even as isolated as they are. But. Yeah. What about males and females? Have you noticed any difference between in terms of uh, in terms of the signals, um, I think that there's been some perceptions that uh, the emotional swings are uh, sometimes more varied, but I I think that uh, you know that is it's not clear yet. Um, I think that on an individual basis, some people are definitely more response responsive. That is, you'll see a change faster or more dramatically. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, my own observation is that there's no, no, it, if there's a difference, it's not, it's not substantial yet. Do you ever give the user access to the raw um, signals from the brain, or are they always pass through your algorithms? They're first? always passed through the algorithms. Thirty years from now, do you see something like this being used to drive cars? Drive cars? Cars are driving south. I can I can imagine uh, I can imagine it slowing the car down when uh, it realizes that you're afraid and pushing the throttle down is a bad idea. <laughs> that I can imagine. Um, yeah, I, you know wh whether you're going to be able to just uh, do things by the speed of thought. I think. Um, the trouble then becomes how do you control your thoughts in a way that you're going to get the reaction that you want? Because uh, most people don't think that precisely. You've got that filter in between. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It gives you actually a moment to think twice before you do that. That thing that was a bad idea. Seeing your background in Luke Stars, when are we going to see a Star Wars game? Star Wars <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well. Uh, at the moment, I think those guys are pretty busy right now, so um, hopefully uh, once they get a little further along, it'll be more obvious. So. The SDK free for download? The SDK Lite is free for download. So if you go up to the website, uh, there's a developer uh, link at the main menu. And if you follow that, you'll see an SDK Lite uh, request down in the bottom left-hand corner. If you, if you select that, it'll send an email confirmation for you to be able to download the SDK Lite. And, you know, not only is it, uh, you know, it gives you the, the keyboard emulation, and it gives the composer, which is uh, emulating the, the, the signals coming from the headset, but it explains uh, what the nature of the API is and what all the detections that are exposed are. It's a subset of what we've shown. Um, that is that it's an earlier release of the software, but it, it gives you enough to give you a sense of structure and how the uh, software is attached to applications. And after the game uh, developers uh, showed, you had a lot of interest from other parties interested in building games with, for which this is a verb. We, we have, and I think that um, uh, the, what's interesting is we've had just as much interest in the space, in, in activities outside the game space, through the game development conference. So uh, both have been relevant to us. And the, the, the problem that we have as a small company is uh, not spreading ourselves too thin 
um, and trying to support too many different actions at the same time. He won't let me look. Now, the, the wireless uh, transmitter uh, overpowers the, the lightweight transmitters we use in the headset. So we have to be careful about being too close while we're transmitting. Can you comment on your experiences with uh, people with disability for accessibility uh, type tasks? Can I comment on my? Experience with people with disabilities on accessibility tasks. Uh, well, I, I have to say that we haven't trialed it yet because the beta headset has only been available for um, literally, uh, you know, we showed it for the first time at GDC in, nice. in February. Um, so I think that really that's, um, that's something that we're going to be doing looking forward. But we're at a point now where that's practical. Uh, it wasn't really practical in the earlier version of the headset that required, um, it was just, it was more sensitive to set up and, and uh, required more instruction and handling. I'm going to test the notion of performance anxiety right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you have to look at that little screen. Yeah. You push it away. What is that noise? you got to get back to what you're doing with your training. You know, trainer wants one. A little bit. And there we are. Ready? <laughs> All right. <laughs> well okay. done. It's tough when everyone's watching. <laughs> just think what you had to do to get Stanford to be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's go. Uh, there's a few more slides in the deck that uh, you're welcome to check out um, in the <laughs> um, PDF file. So, yeah, but it'll give a little more background on how they. Uh, the uh, applications attached and so on. You mentioned a couple of times things other than, other than games and disabled. Um, or uh, any comments on any of those or just mention them? Um, you know, at this point, there there's nothing public. Uh, so it's it's early days for us. And, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, but, uh, and, uh, thanks for coming. Yeah. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.